Hello, 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 hello. Okay, I'm going to work with you on the problem of the Doppler shift. Let's first deal with the Doppler shift of sound. The speed of sound I call V of S. Here's a transmitter which generates in its own frame of reference sound with the frequency F0. Here is the receiver which moves in this direction with speed V receiver and it records that this F0 generated in this frame of reference is recorded in the receiving frame as F prime. How do we derive that? I suggest you look it up on the web. They probably lead you step by step through the derivation. What is not so intuitive that whether the transmitter moves away from the receiver has a different effect than whether the receiver moves away from the transmitter. It's not so intuitive. And it will not be the case with general relativity with electromagnetic radiation, but it is the case with sound. Okay. In general, the equation holds lambda equals V divided by the frequency. So in this reference frame, if you were standing on the car that is moving with this speed, you are generating in that reference frame a wavelength lambda zero, V will then be the speed of sound, and F zero is the frequency that you use as your sound generator. However, since you are moving, after one second, the transmitter has generated thousand wavelengths because it's thousand hertz. But in the meantime, it has moved over a distance Vt. And so those thousand wavelengths are now divided over a longer distance. And so the wavelength, lambda prime, that is now going to move in this direction, is larger than the wavelength lambda zero in its own frame of reference. And it's clearly obvious that the increase is this factor. If V of t is one third of V of s, then lambda prime increases by 30%. So what happens here is, is a change in wavelength as the waves leave the transmitter. What happens here is something different. So those lambda prime waves arrive here, but the speed with which they pass the years of the observer R is not V of S, because the waves move in with speed V of S, but the receiver moves away with speed V of R. And so the speed with which the waves go over the ears of the receiver is lower. It's V of S minus V of R. That's the reason why I put here a V and not a V of S. Because in the case of the receiver, this V is lower than V of S. If you have digested this basic concept, that here there is a wavelength change, therefore effectively a frequency change. But here there is a speed change. The wavelength doesn't change anymore. And that also causes effectively a frequency change. And the net result is this equation. F prime, that is the frequency which the receiver will record, is 1 minus Vr over Vs. 
divided by 1 plus Vt over Vs. And this equation is sign-sensitive. In other words, you may find it in your book differently because they have adopted a different sign convention. For me, whenever T, the transmitter, goes away from R, for me that's a plus sign. And whenever the receiver goes away from the transmitter, for me that is a plus sign. So, if both go away from each other, this goes away from R and R goes away from T, this is a minus sign and this is a plus sign, but this VR is then positive and the VT is then positive. It is sign sensitive. Let us first look at the situation that the receiver moves away from T with a speed VR. And let this VR be the speed of sound. Well, if the receiver moves away with the speed of sound, the sound can never reach the receiver. And so notice that this is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, so the frequency is 0. So that makes sense. The sound never receives R. Let us now move the transmitter in this direction. So this becomes a minus sign then. And let us move the transmitter with the speed of sound. So that becomes 1 minus 1, that becomes infinitely large. That's what causes the sonic boom. The wavelength will then all go to zero. Because this is 1 minus Vt over Vs, this becomes a minus sign. So the wavelengths become zero, and all those zero wavelengths are together. And so when they go over the years of number of the receiver, there is a huge boom. All these waves, thousands of waves that reach your ear simultaneously with zero wavelengths pass your ear. And that causes what's called the sonic boom. When a plane flies through the sound barrier, all the wavelengths of the sound that it produces itself stay at the wings. Because it has the same speed now as the sound would move. And so when it goes slightly faster, it has to break through that barrier. That causes the sonic boom. So, I hope I have convinced you that this equation looks very healthy. And that it is sign sensitive. So in our case, since they move both away from each other, we need positive signs for both. So let's go to here. The problem was that the... Oh, no, no, I have... <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is the situation. The transmitter in question one goes away with two-thirds the speed of sound. This was the speed of sound and goes in this direction, the receiver, with one-third the speed of sound. So the answer is that F prime becomes 400 hertz. You apply the equation that I just arrived, and you find 400 hertz. In this case, that the transmitter goes with one-third the speed of sound, but the receiver with two-thirds, the reduction is larger. You get 250 hertz. Remember what I said earlier that it makes a difference whether the transmitter moves with a certain speed or whether the receiver moves with a certain speed. That is not intuitive, but that is the case. So the problem is not symmetric. If the transmitter moves with a speed of, let's say, one-tenth of the speed of sound, you get a different Doppler shift than if the receiver moves with one-tenth the speed of sound. And you've seen that as a result of my equation. So, these are the answers to 1 and 2. Now, special relativity. 
I am here and on the planet Pythagoras, electromagnetic radiation, one gigahertz, are generated in this frame of reference, but it is moving with two-thirds of the speed of light in this direction. And on planet Einstein, the receiver is moving with one-third the speed of light. And the question now is, what is this f prime if the frequency generated here in its frame of reference is one gigahertz? And then the fourth question is, we change the same thing that we did with the sound. Now we make Einstein the transmitter and we make Pythagoras the receiver. Two-thirds speed of light, one-third speed of light. Now comes something that you may remember from our 1000 GeV proton problem. We also had to add velocities according to special relativity. And if you've forgotten, you may want to brush up on that. So the question is now, what is the speed with which the receiver will see the transmitter go away from me? It's not one-third plus two-thirds. That would be the speed of light. Not at all. You now have to apply the equation that I also used with the 1000 GeV proton problem. That if you stand on E, you will see t go away from you with this speed. It's the sum of these two speeds divided by 1 plus the product of the two speeds divided by c squared. And it is exactly the same speed which, which a person standing here will see Einstein planet go away from him. Those speeds are the same. Same equation applies. And if now you put in the numbers, there's complete symmetry now. You get Vr plus Vt here, 1 plus Vr Vt divided by c squared. You get 9 11 times the speed of light. So beta is 9 11. It's very nice to work with beta in terms of v over c. So now you will have to do your homework. What am I doing? Oh, I am ahead of myself. Yeah, you now have to look up the Doppler shift, or relativistic Doppler shift. I'm not going to derive it, but you should definitely make an effort, if you have any knowledge of special relativity, to digest this. The frequency f prime is this value, I forgot to mention here, times F0. <laughs> and it's again sign sensitive. If the two fly away from each other, and it doesn't matter, you cannot even say which of the two is moving. But all that matters is the relative speed between the two. And if the relative speed between the two is receding, then beta here is positive, both here and there. If they are approaching, then beta here is negative and beta here is negative. So this becomes a plus and this becomes a minus. We call this redshift because when they recede from each other, the frequency 
goes down, and when they approach each other, the frequency goes up. I hope you can see the F0 here. So now I apply this equation to our case. Our case was easy because beta is 9 elevenths. And so you find immediately that the frequency goes down substantially and becomes 3.16 times 10 to the 8 hertz. And originally it was a gigahertz, 10 to the 9th. So this answer is the same for 3 and for 4. There's no difference. You cannot even ask the question who is moving and who is not moving. Now, question number 5. Question number 5, cosmology, deals with Hubble's law. Here is Walter on his planet, and here is the planet Pythagoras, which is moving away from Walter with two-thirds the speed of light. And, and at that planet we generated earlier one gigahertz, but that's irrelevant now. I want to know the distance between me and the planet. Hubble's law says that the speed, the receding speed between two galaxies very far apart is Hubble's constant times the distance between them. So there is a connection, a linear connection between the speed of receding and the distance. And Hubble's constant has been measured lately quite accurately it is about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Megaparsec is a distance. And the distance of a megaparsec is 3.26 times 10 to the 6 light years. Since two thirds of the speed of light is 200,000 kilometers per second, I can now use Hubble's law to calculate d. If you calculate d in terms of megaparsecs, you will find this. Astronomers work in megaparsecs, I can't help that. If you want to work in light years, it is about 9 billion light years. If you want to work in kilometers, which no sane person would do, then this is the answer. 9 billion light years. So what that means, if I would look through my telescope, and I would see any light coming from the planet Pythagoras, it will take nine bill, it took nine billion years to reach me. So I see that planet as it was nine billion years ago. So if this planet starts generating one gigahertz radio emission, it will take 9 billion years before I will see them. I haven't even talked about planet Einstein. I'm just only talking now about the distance between me and Pythagoras. This was not an easy problem. What I like about it, it combines three very pieces of physics. Doppler shift of sound, which is very different from relativistic Doppler shift, and I put a little pepper and salt at the end to remind you of the expansion of the universe with Hubble's law. By the way, the reason why I have an uncertainty here is that the 72 is probably uncertain by about 4%. So I have put a 4% error in here, 4% error in here, and a 4% error in there. All right? You may not want to be friends with me anymore because I have a feeling that many of you who did not spend the time to review this and to use articles from the web, those who didn't spend that time may probably have been lost. So let's still try to be friends.